Amen. You know, we started talking about, about entering the rest of God and that the Bible specifically teaches that it's a promise that's left unto us. We need to make it an emphasis on our lives because if we leave it out, it makes all the difference of whether we live in peace and without stress and with the supernatural favor of God on our lives, which we all want, don't we? We all desire abundant favor. We all desire relief from the trials and the tests of this world, from the pressures of being opposed to the evil of this world. You know, we are promised a life of rest, and and I've been building a foundation, or I should say the Spirit's been building a foundation that we could, can use the book of Ruth to highlight, to demonstrate, to give pictures and illustrations of what Christ Jesus did for us and what, what is ours. Our inheritance is that we live in peace in this life and not destruction and not mental anguish or fear or worry. Amen. That promise has been given unto us, but we have to pay attention to it. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, we should fear lest any man, any of us, doesn't understand how to stay in that place because it takes a warfare, a warfare against lies, against condemnation from the enemy, and against the deception of sin. But in the book of Ruth, uh, and I've taught on Ruth one time, and it was years ago, and really, you know, most people think Ruth is primarily a love story, and it is, amen? There's many types or pictures of other things in the Ruth, in the book of Ruth besides the love story, but Ruth herself is actually a picture of the church. You know, she was an outsider. She was a Moabite. They weren't under the covenant of God. Uh, the Bible says that the Moabite, I think it's in Deuteronomy 23, 23, the Moabite is cursed because they cannot enter into the congregation of the Lord. In other words, they, because of what they had done to Israel by not embracing God's people and giving them drink and food when they wandered through their land, the Bible says that, that God said, for ten generations you will not enter the congregation of the Lord. And then the Moabites hired the false prophet to curse them. Remember that? So Ruth, Ruth came from this gene genealogy, this lineage. I want to I give the backup because sometimes we forget. I need to be reminded, too, of what's the backstory of where we start where Naomi, who is actually a type of Israel, she's a type of the Jewish people, where she first meets Ruth. So the Bible says that um, there was, in the time of the judges, do you remember this? I think it's the very last verse in the book of Judges, the very last chapter. So in that time, there was no king over Israel. Okay? And the people basically did what they wanted. And at which what that means is they didn't follow after God. They didn't follow after his ways or his commandments or, or didn't seek him. But they did what they wanted. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So the standard or the measure of righteousness is God's law as well as Jesus Christ. But they rejected both. And they did whatever they thought was right. So God said, if you don't follow my laws, these curses will come upon you. And because they were living according to their own performance or under the law, they were cursed. And there was a famine in the land where the Jewish people lived. So Naomi was married to a man named Elimelech. 
And he was a godly man, and they were both godly. But because of the famine, the Bible says they'd heard about there being wheat available in Moab. So they picked up with their two sons and probably their whole household, and they left the land of their inheritance. Remember, at this time, under the law, if you were of a tribe or this tribe or that tribe, you were given access to land. You had an inheritance. And with that land, you could provide a living for your family. You could grow crops. You could raise animals. You know, there were no stores. You know this. So they left that and they went to Moab, which is east of the Dead Sea, if you know the map. And when they went to Moab, yeah, they found wheat. But they found personal tragedy. Naomi's husband died, and both of her sons died. But her sons died after they had both married Moabite women. So she lost her sons, but she had two daughter-in-laws. You know, at that time, news travels slowly. Not like, you know, you can't text and uh, find out what's going on in back in Bethlehem or back in your land of inheritance. But she heard that God had been merciful to the nation of Israel in spite of their rebellion and had blessed them. See, God, even during a time when Israel was cursed, God heard their cries. He was merciful. He blessed them and the famine was over. So she heard about that. So she told her daughter-in-laws, I'm going back to my homeland. And they both initially said, yeah, we'll go with you. And I, this is kind of where we want to start in the book of Ruth, first chapter. There's a lot of revelation. Well, there's a lot of revelation in the whole Bible. But there's a lot of revelation in the book of Ruth that is really specific to uh, the church. Amen. Chapter 1, verse 6. So this is speaking of Naomi. Then she, Naomi, arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread back in Palestine. Okay, She began to prepare to move her whole life. If you've ever done that, you know that can be a trial. But she... She said to her daughters-in-law, she said to both of them, that they should go back to their mother's country. They should go back to Moab. Because she said, for instance, you know, I don't, she didn't have a husband. She, she lost her claim of it, prosperity through the inheritance law of, the, of God, the Mosaic law. She lost claim to it because the claim for land was based on an heir, a son. And both her sons died. So what she had and what her husband had received because he was a son in land, they lost it all. Okay? Now remember, the book of Ruth includes incredible types and shadows of the church, the nation of Israel, and the Lord Jesus Christ who is typified in the character of Boaz. And if you've read the story, you know, Boaz is called Naomi's kinsman redeemer. It's a twofold role that Boaz plays. Kinsman in that she, he, excuse me, is her relative. Now remember, Jesus Christ didn't come as an angel. He came as a man. He was born of a woman like you and I. He, he was our brother. The Bible calls him our brother. So he is our kinsman or he is our relative and was and is and always will be our elder brother. Amen. So Boaz, like Jesus, was Naomi's kinsman dash redeemer. And what does a redeemer do? A redeemer pays for something for you, which is what Jesus did for us. He didn't know the debt we owed, but he. what we'll find out about Boaz is that his character 
And his heart was very similar to the heart of Jesus Christ. In fact, I want to, if I can find it, I want to read a quote. Here it is. A commentator said this. In Judges, or in the book of Judges, commentator says, we meet a woman who was as strong as a man. Who's that? Anybody know? Deborah. But in Ruth, we meet a man who was as tender as a woman. That's Boaz. I thought that was really good. So Jesus is our kinsman's redeemer. In other words, he paid for the debt that we couldn't pay for. And yet we owed it. And he set us free from that debt. And in that, in that finished work of the cross, he not only set us free, but he provided an inheritance for us. In other words, a place that we didn't work for or a resource and uh, blessings that we could not work for and yet we get for free. We get, the, we get the stuff for free, don't we? Freely, we've received. Amen. And so we'll talk about Boaz more, but that's kind of where, what I want you to think of is that Ruth represents the church, an outsider, the, the gospel was first preached to the Jew. Jesus himself said, and this I'm talking about in the wilderness, in the rebellion, but Jesus himself said, don't you know I, I'm first sent to the Jew to preach what? To preach the gospel, the good news, that you can have a life of rest, that you can have your burdens taken off your back, that your sin doesn't have to bring the curse upon your life anymore, but God will accept you. That's the gospel. And we can trust in that, and we should. And I believe that Naomi knew this, and she, she at least she knew that God was good, that God was merciful, and that he was God. Amen? In some ways, Ruth in the book of Ruth is the redeemed. When we get finally to the chapter where she is, is going to be married to Boaz, she's been redeemed by the Redeemer, Boaz. So we see both the redeemed and the Redeemer. We see the church or the bride of Christ in Ruth, and we see the husband, Boaz, as Jesus Christ. Amen? So there's a lot of neat things like that we can discover, and I certainly... Don't know them all, and I probably won't have time for all of them, but nevertheless, Ruth was an outsider. Though the law said she could not have the benefit and the blessings of the mercy of God, God's mercy and grace accepted her. Amen? And that's why we see her as, the, as a type of the church. So nevertheless, let me just like paraphrase. So Naomi's like, no. You can't really, you shouldn't go with me. You should go back. You're, you're an outsider. You're not from this place. And you need to go back. And on top of that, I, I'm too old to have kids for you. And even if I did, even if I got married tomorrow, and then I had a child, are you going to wait another 18 years for that boy to grow up? No. She's saying that doesn't make sense. Right? So she says, go back. And so the two daughter-in-laws were Orpah and Ruth. And Orpah went back. She thought about going with Ruth, but she listened to reason and she went back. Amen. Now let's go to verse 14. So Naomi has given these instructions and the Bible says, Then they lift the girls, lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. In other words, she kissed her goodbye. But look at this. Ruth, the King James says, clave. Ruth clung to her. And this is what Ruth said. You know this, verse 16. But Ruth said, entreat me not, or don't pressure me. Don't urge me to leave you. Because that's what Naomi was doing. Or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you 
lodge or live, I will live. Your people shall be my people. Now, they both knew under the law that's not even acceptable. But Ruth has, I believe, at this point in her life, has faith. Because she heard Naomi speak of truth, speak the words of God. And what happens when you receive the words of God? What comes? Faith. Okay, so that's really key to entering into the rest of God. And we'll look at the scripture. Your people shall be my people and your God. Not Moab had gods, the Moabites, false gods. But your God, she makes the claim that she will honor Jehovah God, Yahweh. Amen. Your God shall be my God. Verse 17. Where you die, I will die. In other words, nothing's going to separate me, she's saying, from you. And there I will be buried. She is making a proclamation of the dedication of the rest of her life to serve her mother-in-law. Remember, we said one of the tenets of entering into God's rest is humbling ourselves. She humbled herself to Ruth's will. Amen? Wherever you go, I'm going to go. Where you die, I'm going to die. There I will be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also. If anything but death parts you and me. In other words, if God does anything to you, he's done it to me. I will endure what you're going to endure. I think one of the reasons this is in the Bible is that you know, God chose what stories to tell us. Amen. What we'll see in the book of Ruth is that there were certain attitudes in the heart of Ruth that should be in the church. If we are, if she's a type of the church, then we need to, I believe, look at the tenderness of her heart. Is that important to God? What, what does the Bible say in Samuel when they were looking for the king and the prophet was looking for the king and, and uh, Jesse had all these handsome tall boys come before him and he didn't pick any of them, did he? What did God say about David? Man looks on the outside, but God looks at the heart. So the heart's very important. And what we see in Ruth is we see a tenderness and a softness and a pliability, which means she's vulnerable. That's so important. A vulnerable person is either stupid or they're trusting in a higher power. Right? Because what? Because we've all been hurt. Because we know how ugly people can be. We know how hard the circumstances and the trials of this life can be. And so the natural tendency of the person who's not trusting in God is to be hard-hearted because I am not going to get hurt again. And that is exactly opposite of the heart that God is after. I want to um, go to Hebrews, and we're going to come back to Ruth. And I want to look at why the nation of Israel didn't enter, that first generation didn't enter into God's rest. Remember, they wandered 40 years in the wilderness. We're going to go to Hebrews 3rd chapter. Five reasons why that generation died in the wilderness. In the Bible calls, in the provocation. What's that mean? That means they were rebelling against God. and provoking him, okay? Marilyn, pull, it, pull this up in passion because I really like this in the passion. There were all, all these reasons that actually Hebrews 3 and Hebrews 4 provides for why they fell in the wilderness, why they died, why they didn't enter into the land, and in, by so entering, they would have entered into the promise of rest. Because what did God say about the place he was giving them? What did he say about the inheritance? He said, it's a land filled with milk and honey. The produce is huge. The resources are bountiful. 
He said, you're, you're, you, when you go there, I will fight your battles for you and I will run the enemy out a bit at a time. And what you'll find is that as the enemy leaves, they leave, their, the houses will be yours. The gardens will belong to you. You don't. You didn't work for the gardens. You didn't hoe the gardens. You didn't toil till the ground. No. What? You didn't dig the wells, but it's all yours. See, these are typologies of, of your salvation, of what you have inherited because of what Jesus did for us. Amen? So the lifestyle that you and I can live is one without lack without striving, without stress, without worry. Amen. So God, through the author here, is talking about the time that the nation of Israel wandered in the desert and how that they had fought, literally fought against God. If you were to read the whole chapter before we get to verse 10, you'd see that God is talking about how the nation of Israel responded to him based on their experience in the wilderness and not based on what God said. The, this ignited my anger with that generation. And I said about them, they wander in their hearts just like they do with their feet and they refuse to learn my ways. So they wander in their hearts just like they do with their feet. In the King James, it says, they do always err in their hearts. What's that mean? Their problem is what their heart leads them to do. So their heart's corrupt. Their heart's not fixed on God's word. I want to read this. Don't, don't go there. I'm just going to read it real quick. Go back to Psalms 112, I think. Talking about a righteous person. That's you. Amen. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed. His heart is fixed. His heart is not wandering as their feet wandered. So did their heart. Looking for, looking, looking. Not listening and believing and trusting in God and God's promise and God's words, but looking away from God to something else. But your and I hearts are fixed, trusting in the Lord. That person is established. That person shall not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemy. So the difference between the heart of Israel and the, your and my heart should be that our heart is not wandering away from God, looking for the answer somewhere else, looking to vent, looking to blame, looking for a way of escape. He is our way of escape, the Bible says. So our when uh, we know our heart is fixed is when trouble comes and we don't turn away from God. We say, no, I can trust God. I know that he'll get me through this. That's what God's looking for. Okay? That's a choice. But God calls it rebellion when we turn to man or we turn to something else to find the answer. That's rebellion. And he goes on to say, and they refuse to learn my ways. Well, you know, I don't really need to read the Bible. Well, you, we do. We need to learn his ways. Well, I just, I just need to know, trust my pastor. That's not looking and trusting in God. Amen. Every one of us can receive light and revelation concerning truth of the word of God. And we should. Amen. And if, if, if any of us say something that doesn't quite sit right with you, I think you have a, have, I shouldn't say obligation because I don't teach obligations, but you and I, it is, it is, it is best for us to check it out. You know, I mean, I'm not perfect. Wait for my husband to say amen. My husband is like Boaz. Check it out. Amen. But we can know the ways of God. Amen. Because why? How can we know the ways of God? Jesus said, I am the way. He gives us all of his access to truth. Amen. So two things. Their heart's not fixed. Number two, they don't learn God's ways. We understand that. Number three, verse 12. So search your hearts every day, my brothers and sisters. 
And make sure that none of you has evil or unbelief hiding within you. That's pretty serious. But he's teaching to the whole church across the world. Amen. Truth is truth. There's no deception like self-deception. For it will lead you astray and make you unresponsive to the living God. Wow. That is huge. So many Christians say, I don't sense God. I don't feel God. I don't hear from God. Check your heart. Is your, has your heart become hard and unresponsive to God? God is always moving. In fact, the Bible says he's always speaking. His word goes out 24 hours a day into the heart of his people, into the world. Although they reject it, the word's still available. We all probably go through what I call, might call wilderness or dry times in our lives. When it, yeah, it seems like God's hard. It's hard to hear from God or it's hard to get hooked up. We all do that. There are seasons of testing. We need to make sure that we're not responsible for the, the gap or the distance that we feel from God. And we need to check whether or not our hearts are tender and soft. Verse 13 talks about this again. This is the time to encourage each other to never be stubborn or hardened by hardened. Now he's talking about the hardness of your heart, our hearts. How does it often come? By sin's deceitfulness. This is huge. See, a lot of people don't understand or they, they assume I can live any way I like, and you can if you're a believer. But there is an effect that occurs in our hearts if we bow our knee to sin. What is it? That your heart actually becomes calloused or hard, the deceitfulness of sin. So what happens is sin, like Moses, seems like pleasure for a season, the Bible says in Hebrews 11. He didn't, he didn't bow his knee to that pleasure. There's a price to pay. And it isn't that God loves us less. It isn't that he accepts us less. It's that our heart becomes hard. I mean, you can see this in people's faces. Have you ever seen somebody and you look at that person, you know, oh, that person living a rough life. Why? That hardness, instead of tenderness and softness towards God, can be replaced with a deception that sin, I can handle this sin. It's okay. God still loves me. It's true. God still loves me and he accepts me, but I'm hurting myself because now I have a hard heart. And not only am I unresponsive to, the, to God and to the spirit, that I'm unresponsive to people. The Bible says that we should know one another after our spirits. I'm not talking about reading somebody's mind. I'm talking about being sensitive to their spirit, being open and willing and able to provide whatever it is they need, whether they need prayer or compassion or love or encouragement and support. This is huge because it really is about relationships and not just with God, with people in the body of Christ. Even with unbelievers, hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You know, allowing sin to control us actually opens the door. I was just talking about this to you. Opens the door to be deceived. And what you used to easily be able to discern, all of a sudden becomes like foggy. And truth doesn't become that plumb line it all of a sudden is now you're easily taken or deceived. Now, none of us wants to be deceived, do we? The Bible doesn't teach you that if you're smart enough, you won't be deceived. But the Bible teaches you that if your heart is tender and responsive to God, then he and his word will rightly divide what's good and evil, what's truth and what's a lie. And you won't be taken by a lie. Why? Because your heart's responsive to the Holy Spirit. Do you see how important this is? All right, that was number three. Don't be stubborn or hard-hearted. Be vulnerable. 
It's, it's decision time. For we are mingled with the Messiah. If you took a cup of water and then you took a cup of lemonade, no, let's say Kool-Aid, don't drink it though, and you poured it into the water, you're mingling the two, aren't you? We are mingled with the Messiah if we will continue unshaken in this confident assurance from the beginning until the end, trusting him, not allowing fear to dictate our thoughts or our allegiances. Verse 15, go ahead and go there. For again, the scripture says, quoting the Psalms, if only today you would listen to his voice, don't make him angry by hardening your hearts as you did in the wilderness rebellion. So again, he's talking about the condition of their heart and how their heart was hardened. Why? Because they didn't listen to him. They didn't listen to his voice. They didn't trust his words. I know this is really simple, but don't discount it that it's too simple. When we know to do right, the Bible says, and we don't do it, that's sin. Well, that's pretty heavy. That's just sim- the simple truth. And what, ca- what happens then is our heart gets hard. And when you have a hard heart, you're hardened towards the voice of the Spirit, towards the voice of the one who should be leading you and directing you and steering you away from problems. So we need to listen to his voice. And what did Jesus say? My sheep hear my voice. You know, don't try to, I can't hear from God. I mean, God's a lot smarter than our weakness. And he knows how to get through to you. What's it take? It takes a responsive and willingness and a tender heart. Doesn't take years and years of study. Nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't take that. God is attracted to a tender heart because he can work with that. That's what he's made one of his ways. What's the Bible say? He opposes the proud, but he lifts up and exalts the humble. You know this, amen. It's still, we need to hear it, don't we? Hear his voice. And then finally, Hebrews 4, 2. Go ahead and jump there. We'll just start at 1 and then we'll jump to 2. I really like this in the Passion. All of this is expressive of the tenderness of Ruth's heart. And as you study the book of Ruth, you'll see that all of these factors are are in which a non-believing, unbelieving, cursed Moabite found the favor of God and entered into a covenant or the rest of God, her marriage to, to Boaz. Now remember, Ruth is in the lineage of, the, of King David, and she's in the lineage of Jesus Christ. That's huge. That's awesome. Now God has offered to us the same promise of entering into his realm of resting in confident faith. So we must be extremely careful to ensure that we all embrace the fullness of that promise and not fail to experience it. What if we fail to experience it? Then we will have a life of strife, a life of worry, a life of anxiety, a life of never feeling rested inside. So it's a pretty harsh admonition. In fact, it's the only admonition of its kind in the entire New Testament. There is no other place that the writer says, you should fear not entering into his rest. There's no other place. What does God want? He wants the best for you and I. Amen. Jesus paid a steep enough price that we can have the promise of living in that rest. For we have heard the good news of deliverance, just as they did. The King James says, we've heard the gospel or the good news was preached unto them. In many times, the Bible says the good news, the gospel was preached unto the nation of Israel in the wilderness. Yet they didn't join their faith with the word. What word? The word was that you can have this inheritance. And you don't have to pay for it. But you need to trust me. And when there's no water, trust me. And when there's no food, trust me. And when you're wandering around in the desert and you don't know where to go, 
You need to trust me. Amen. That was required. And you need to keep your heart right. And you need to keep your heart right towards Moses and Aaron. I mean, you know how many times they want to kill him? Keeping your heart right means keeping your heart tender. Yet their faith, their faith in what? They had faith. Faith had come. Moses preached to them. They had faith. But it wasn't mixed with the word that God said, trust me and I will keep you and you will walk into a land blessed, filled. I keep thinking of this uh, vision I had when I was uh, in Singapore. And we were, <laughs> it was like 5 o'clock in the morning. And, of course, we had to get up and pray. Because the leader of our team was, wake up, get up and pray. <laughs> that wasn't you. <laughs> Just looking at you. It was a... Uh, an ama- kind of an amazing time because we had just flown into the country. We were on our way to India, and there was like four or five of us women. And we couldn't go into India because there was a coup that had been performed against the government, and the whole state, you might call it, was on lockdown. There were no no transportation. People were in the streets just going nuts and... It was dangerous. So we got held over in Singapore. The first morning we woke up, you know, I mean, I had like jet lag. And I'm like, the last thing I want to do is pray. I just want to stay in bed, you know. Get up. <sighs> got to pray. And we heard this noise outside. And I looked out the window, and that's when they were having that. Annually, they have a, a festival. It's uh, called Taipusan, in which the men in the family, the males, usually the husband, pierce themselves with long skewers, metal skewers, just like you'd hog tie a pig, you know. And they'd put them through their body, and they're quite, you know, they might have a thousand skewers in their body. Obviously, it's very painful, but they they use, um, like, pain-deadening, powders and stuff but still painful and then i mean their legs their face i mean you just some of them are just crazy and they go on this long pilgrimage towards this high place in the city and they're paying for the sins of their family praying unto the gods that they'll be blessed that they'll receive the rain or whatever they need and it was it was just the whole thing was surreal so i'm like you know brain dead and they got this stuff going on out here and you know they put all these colorful powders on their body and it's just this like bizarre perverse parade and they're making noise and blowing horns and we begin to pray and we're right in downtown singapore i for some reason went to the window and i was looking outside the window all of a sudden i got caught up in the spirit and i began to see a vision of a garden in the middle completely surrounded by high-rise buildings and singapore is quite the you know um current modern city with high rises and and all the modern conveniences i mean it's huge one of the biggest shipping ports in the world and i looked and i saw in the middle of this like a square i saw a broken down kind of a real simple garden in fact, it was like um, a stone garden. The walls were stone. And there were women going into the garden, and they were harvesting grapes. And they were going out of the garden. And as I, as I watched the scene before me, because it was set like it was in Bible days, and it was, it was I, didn't have an, I didn't have a clue what I was seeing. But when they would come out of the garden, it was like in the book of, of um, Joshua, where they sent the spies into the land, remember? And the Bible says, and they came back with the fruit of the land, and the grapes were huge. And this is, that. I mean, have you ever eaten a grape that big? You know, this was like, and I, and I began to, think, what am I seeing here? What is this about, you know? And the Lord showed me later about 
the outpouring of his spirit on the nation of Singapore, but it's a, it's a spiritual analogy to the life of rest. In other words, you and I have been given an opportunity to live in God's garden. The Bible says he's the farmer. He's the husbandman. He has done the work for us, and he will provide. And, and as I'm looking at this huge um, crops that, I mean, there's like two or three grapes they're holding on their shoulders and carrying them out, or they're carrying them like, like this. And I, as I began to just keep looking, I saw all of a sudden the windows of some of the high-rise buildings burst forth with water flowing out like, as, I mean, thousands and tens and hundreds of thousands of gallons of water pouring into the city. And the Lord showed me later, yeah, that was his, his blessing on the nation of Singapore. And if you know anything about um, some of the ministries in Singapore, like Joseph Prince, that that's what God has really done and used that nation to be a spring as well, welling up for the needs of the nations. But that's what the life of rest is. God, <clears throat> when we rest in his word and what his voice has said, and we don't doubt, amen, then God's going to bring in not just provision, but abundant, super abundant. That's the promise. Above all that you can ask or think, that's the promise. More than you would even ask for, because what do I do with all these grapes? I can't even eat one in a day. I mean, come on. But the life of rest is, is something that is greater than we've in, even experienced. Amen? I'm reading verse 2. Let me get through this and then I want to close. For we have heard the good news of deliverance just as they did, yet they didn't join their faith with the word. And God said, this is what I'm going to do for you. I'm offering you life over death. I'm offering you prosperity over lack. Yet they didn't join their faith with his word. Instead, what they heard, they didn't affect them deeply for they doubted. So what's it take to enter into the life of rest besides having a responsive heart, a tender heart? It takes faith and believing when all the circumstances coming at you are contrary to what God said, faith in what he said will allow us not just to enter into his rest, but to stay in that place and to stay dependent upon his goodness, his mercy, his grace. Amen. <music> 